Hello. There is an incredible storm going on outside right now, which is lovely, but you might hear some thunder in the background. Occasionally, it's getting a little loud. And today I have picked out an article by Roger Lancelin Green called Myths of the Norsemen for your listening pleasure. I hope you enjoy it. Like, share, sub, comment. I appreciate it. And let's get started. Perhaps as long ago as 8000 BC, a group of nomadic tribes wandered south into India and westward into Central Europe from a homeland somewhere west of the Caspian Sea. These divergent groups shared a common language, Indo-European, a knowledge of farming and the worship of certain gods. First among their gods was a sky god, probably named something like Deva, as in India, or Diu, Zeus, as in Greece. Romans called him Dupater, or father god, which became Jupiter. The names gradually changed as tribes settled in different places along the Germanic peoples, among the Germanic peoples of Central and Northern Europe, the father god was called Ziu, Old High German, or Tyr, Icelandic. He was called Tia by the Irish, or Tiu by the British, and from these names is derived Tuesday. Other Northern gods lent their names to the days of the week, Woden's Day, or Thor's Day, and Freya's Day. Although once a unified whole, the oldest myths of the Indo-European gods and goddesses gradually changed and diverged, taking on new meanings in the new lands where the migrant tribes settled. The Norse gods persisted well into the Christian era in Scandinavia and Iceland, and many Norsemen or Vikings continued to take their pride in the gods and heroes of their pagan past. This attitude enabled the old gods and myths to persist in many places, even though many of the stories were lost. Unlike the myths of the ancient Greeks, those of the Norse people were not written down until centuries after these countries were converted to Christianity. In their original forms, found primarily in two collections of poetry, called the Eddas, compiled in the 12th and 13th centuries, the Norse stories often seem fragmented or contradictory. In Myths of the Norsemen, Green connects the various stories and fragments to provide a coherent history of the gods. In many ways, the figures of Norse mythology have influenced Western culture to the same extent as have the Greek gods, although Odin and his band are less studied than the gods of Olympus. The world of the Norse gods is one of valiant and vigilant heroes, yet the doom of a prophecy hangs like a shadow over them. It is foretold that they will be defeated by the forces of chaos in the final battle called Ragnarok. With their fall will come the fall of human civilization, even of the world itself. And yet, beyond this tragic defeat lies a mysterious redemption and renewal. The secret of the rebirth of the world is known only to two of the northern gods, Odin and Baldr. Themes and characters. The major myths. The major theme in myths of the Norsemen is the constant fight against evil conducted by the gods, particularly Odin. Odin's is a constant day-to-day -day battle against the forces of evil in the world. He works unceasingly to prepare for the Battle of Ragnarok, although he knows that this battle ultimately will be lost. Odin also gathers the valiant warriors in Valhalla, where they train for the final battle, and meanwhile lead a life of pleasure. Odin is not merely a warrior. He seeks to gain true wisdom through a combination of knowledge and sacrifice. He gives up one of his eyes for a single, single drink from the fountain of wisdom, 
which allows him to see part of the future. Occasionally, he dons a broad-brimmed hat and a blue cloak, wanders the earth in disguise, and experiences the world of humans firsthand. Thor and Balder, two of Odin's sons, are featured prominently in the tales. Thor, whose mother was the earth, is good-hearted, direct, and loyal. He possesses three treasures, his mighty hammer, iron gloves by which to grasp it, and a belt that when strapped on doubles his already prodigious strength. When he swings his hammer, the thunder roars, lightning flashes, and the frost giants slink back into their dens. Wise and merciful, Baldur is the fairest looking of the gods. When Baldur was born, every mineral and plant in the world swore an oath to never harm him. Yet one lowly plant, the mistletoe, was overlooked, and thus Baldur's invincibility is illusory. Another god is Loki, the son of a giant. Loki is also fair to look upon, but his nature is devious. At first he appears harmless, given to mischief and boyish tricks. But as the story develops, Loki becomes increasingly, increasingly destructive. Instead of using his tricks to serve the Aesir, he becomes an active servant of evil and the agent who finally brings about the downfall of the gods. Loki's true nature can be seen in his children, the half-dead hell of the underworld, the gnawing serpent of Midgard, and a monstrous wolf called Fenris. The gods are exuberant. They love to eat, drink, and laugh. They share Loki's impulsiveness, but not his evil. If adventure presents itself, Thor is sure to jump into the middle of it. If Freya, the most renowned of the goddesses of Asgard, has a chance to trick someone out of a beautiful necklace, she does so and laughs about it afterwards. The gods' high spirits, however, eventually lead to tragedy. During one of their feasts, the gods amuse themselves by throwing their weapons at Baldur, whom they believe to be invulnerable. Their arrows, darts, and boulders harmlessly veer away. But Loki has learned the secret of the mistletoe fashions a javelin from it, and guides the hand of the blind god Holder as he throws it. To everyone's horror, Baldur is pierced, pierced through and falls dead at their feet. Baldur's tragic death begins the decline of the Asir. The Battle of Ragnarok and the Twilight of the Gods swiftly approaches. Green also includes the heroic human drama of Sigurd, his love of Brynhild, his fateful marriage to Gudrun. <laughs> Through this story runs the curse of the evil and body. Setting. Scandinavia is a region of mists and ice, of barren crags and threatening shores, favored only by a short season of sun and crops. The setting of myths of the Norsemen, gives the reader a sense of this harsh land and seascape, but much of the action occurs in a more cosmic realm. Central to this realm is the world tree Yildrasil, a massive evergreen ash that holds up the heavens with its branches and reaches with its roots to the depths of the underworld where dwell the dreaded frost giants. At the crown of the great tree is Asgard, the realm of the gods, who are called the Asir. Here there are many splendid halls, especially Odin's palace, Gladsheim. Nearby is Valhalla, where warriors slain in battle are feasted. From a special seat called Lidskelf, or Heaven Crag, Odin can view all of the worlds at once. He is accompanied by two far-seeing ravens and a giant eagle, whose flapping wings cause the world to blow, the winds to blow. Midgard, the world of humans, is far below. A red squirrel, Ratatoskr, scurries up and down the tree, carrying news of Midgard to Odin or carrying his messages to the earth. 
At the base of the tree is the fountain of wisdom, where dwell three maidens called Norns, who rule the destinies of humans. They are called fate, being, and necessity. The future of the world depends on the health of Yiltrasil, yet it is assaulted from all sides by destruction and decay. A large stag nibbles continually at its foliage. One root of the tree, called Niflheim, is constantly gnawed by an evil ser serpent named Nidhug. Rot eats away at the trunk. It is said that during Ragnarok, the final battle of the gods against the giants, Yildrasil will fall and the world will end. Literary Qualities when taking a, taken as a whole, myths of the Norsemen can, constitutes a major tragedy. Individual episodes, however, have the charm and entertainment value of folklore, full of sudden and surprising events, of shape changings, of riddles, and of unexpected triumphs. These tales strike a deep response. Green's skill at storytelling highlights the delightful, details and maintains continuity of his overall theme. These stories were handed down by word of mouth for centuries. They embody a collective cultural wisdom and in this respect are a valuable part of the human treasury of folk tales, German, English, African, and many others that demonstrate the common humanity of the world's diverse people. Social sensitivity. The world of Norse myth is full of primitive violence. Almost all conflicts are settled with weapons. The Vikings were, after all, the warriors who terrorized Europe for centuries with their raiding and pillaging. Yet violence has not abated in the world. Although the times and weapons have changed, and the reader is challenged to confront this fact, Parents and teachers should help young readers understand that violence only begets further violence, and that there are more lasting ways, such as negotiation and compromise, to solve conflict. Balder, the much beloved, has a truly elevated moral beauty and is greatly mourned at his passing. It is Hodr, who naively casts the seemingly harmless mistletoe at him, and innocence. Innocent though he is, Hodr is slain for his deed, but Balder greets Hodr with joy in the land of the dead, providing an example of magnanimity and forgiveness. Odin travels in disguise among humankind, rewarding goodness, morality, and generous hospitality. In this, he is like the Greek god Zeus, who was the patron of hosts and guests, Unlike Zeus, however, Odin is more restrained in his sexual conquests. Like any common person, he must persistently woo Rinda in order to beget the hero Valley. The Norse gods as a group are more likely to express compassion for the sufferings of humankind than are the Greek gods who seem to protect their favorites at the expense of humankind in general. The Asir would not stoop to make humans fight wars over their own rivalries, as do Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite in the Iliad, Homer's epic of the Trojan War. Nor do they become furious and vengeful if humans are slightly disrespectful or overlook a detail of worship. The Norse gods are notable for always finding the humor in a dark situation, and they struggle as valiantly to save Midgard the abode of humankind as they do to preserve their own halls in Asgard, ultimately sacrificing themselves for this purpose. <clears throat> Related titles, adaptations. Readers who wish to compare Green's myths to the original sources should consult the Prose Edda, compiled in the 13th century by an Icelander named Snorri Sturluson. The Elder Edda, compiled in the 12th century, is a collection of poems written from 800 to 1100 and a good source of Norse myths. The Nibelungenlaid tells the story of Sigmund, Sigurd, and Brunhild in a much expanded version and would be an ambitious reading project. 
the Norse sagas, available in excellent translations by Magnus Magnuson and Hermann Plassen. Our excellent reading for those already familiar with Norse mythology. The Namia books of C.S. Lewis and The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien are both heavily influenced by Norse myth, and German composer Richard Wagner used the Norse myths as the basis for his series of operas, The Ring of the Niblung. So that's it for that um, summary of uh, Mr. Green's article. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. This is only one view of and one interpretation of the Norse sagas and myths. Not necessarily, I don't necessarily agree with all of the things said in here. Um, you know, but it's always good. Norse mythology is one of those things where you just have to read and study and study and study and come to some of your own conclusions. Translation is very important and it can really change things a lot. So read different translations and you will get different viewpoints and takes on things. So I hope you enjoyed it uh, and I will bring you more as I can. Again, like, share, comment. Thank you very much. Have a good night.